Up to now, we've developed a model for counting events, as well as a procedure for estimating the parameters of such a model under real-world observations, thus completing the marriage between mathematical abstraction and reality. So where to from here, you might ask? Well, now we can look into diversions in generalizing the underlying model process, thereby widening the scope of its application. Now, one such generalization is the so-called compound Poisson process, which extends the application of Poisson processes well beyond simply counting events. Indeed, by the end of this lecture, you should be able to stretch the limits of your imagination in coming up with potential applications for models which has the uh, Poisson process as its backbone. So let's jump in. So, what's a compound Poisson process? Well, it's perhaps easiest to explain if we continue sticking elements to our data table which we've used to describe the Poisson process up to now. So, we've taken care of all of the variables on the columns of our data table, and we can also extract the model parameters from entries within that table itself. However, up to now I've continually made reference to counting so-called events of interest being deliberately vague so as to leave room for generalization. Indeed, why these events are of interest, so to say, uh, are of not simply a function of how frequently they occur, i.e. their count, if you will, but also any quanta associated with the arrivals. For example, an insurance company is not merely interested in how many claims it will observe over a given period of time. Surely the size of those claims are of greater consequence to an insurance company. When you're living on the space station, for example, surely you're not just interested in the cumulative number of collisions that the space station will have with space debris, but also the size of the collisions or the cumulative damage incurred over your stay. So, for these purposes, we generalize our model process by adding two more columns or variables to our data table. First, for each increment of the process, so row in our data table, we associate an outcome of a draw from some random variable, call it x, with distribution, say, f. Then we define another random variable, y sub t, which accumulates these outcomes. The process, yt, for t greater than or equal to naught, is then referred to as a compound Poisson process with rate parameter lambda, and, for purposes of our nomenclature, we will refer to x as the so-called compound variable with distribution f, which will have its own parameter set, of course. So, how this works is, at each point where the underlying count process in t increments, um, we make a draw from the distribution f, which is independent from any other draws um, during the trajectory of the process, and then we sum, and then the sum of all of those draws up to that point in time t, hence y sub t, in time gives us the state of the compound process, y sub t. Now it should be immediately clear at this point that this allows for a much more general dynamical behavior than a monotonically increasing discrete count, such as nt. Indeed, the process can now be discrete or continuous state, continuous time, depending on the distribution of x. And we can model all sorts of phenomena using the simple generalization of the Poisson process model. Despite the apparent simplicity of this generalization, finding a distribution of the compound process yt, so its underlying probability model, as you may recall, from first principles, is difficult at best. Indeed, standard distributional forms, uh, even for compound variables with simple distributions, are elusive. Um, so if, as a first crack at the analysis, we resort to our old friend the generating function approach, whereby we identify the generating function of the compound process yt in terms of its constituent parts, and then we conduct the analysis at the hand of the properties that we can extract from that. So, for these purposes, we follow Sturzak's outline for finding the appropriate generating function, which you may actually have seen uh, elsewhere, but which we will complete under the present nomenclature. So let's consider the case where x is discrete and the count variable nt is fixed at some number of n. Okay, so um, that means we've drawn a n x i's up to some point in time t. And I'll include a little n x i for all of the x i's so that we can distinguish them. Okay, so then the first thing we do is we look at the expectation of s to the power y t 
given that that NT is fixed at some particular variable. Okay. Now we can just write that from its definition as the expectation of S to the sum over all of the XI's. Okay, for I running from one to that fixed N. Because remember, YT, what does it do? It accumulates all those independent draws of the compound variable X. Okay, so all of the XI's. Now we can remember that, well, we can just write that S to the power of the sum as a product over all of the S to the power X I's for I running from one to N. Okay, and then because all of those X I's are independent draws, we can actually take the expectation into the product. Okay, so we have the product of I running from one to N over the expectation of S to the power X I, but all of the X I's are identical. Then it draws from some distribution and we recognize that E to the S, uh, e the expectation of s to the power x is just a generating function for that variable x. Okay, so we evaluate that as gxs, which is just the generating function for x raised to the power n. Okay. Now, yt was not conditional on some particular value of n. So yt is a function of both of the draws, the xi's, and the outcome of whatever the counting process is. Okay, so now we account for the variation in nt as follows. Okay, so we derive the generating function of y as gys as just the expectation with respect to y of s to the power yt. And again, that's just the definition of the probability generating function in the case where the process is discrete. Well, <clears throat> using our rules for conditional expectation, we can actually write that expectation as follows. Okay, we can take the expectation of y conditional on n, so of s to the power yt given nt, so, and then integrate over all possible outcomes of n. Okay, so we just integrate over that, we take the expectation over all of the outcomes of n, so we sort of write it as nested expectations, one of which is conditional. Okay, so we condition, we integrate, and then we see that, well, hang on, that expression on the inside of the brackets um, that is something that we have a result for, right? That we've just derived. We see that, well, that's just gxs raised to the power nt, where nt is now treated as a random variable, not as a fixed quantity. And we're taking the expectation with respect to n, so the counting process. Okay, cool. Now, if we look at that expression, we recognize again, well, that just looks like a generating function, right? What is the expression for a generating function? Well, it's the expectation of something, of s to the power something, okay? And then we see that, well, you can just then write the, the generating function of y as a nested set of generating functions. So you take gn, okay? So the generating function for the count process, and you replace its argument with the generating function of x evaluated at s, so the compound variable. Okay, so nice neat result. We've written the generating function of the compound process yt in terms of its constituent parts, the count process and the compound variable x, simply as a nested set of equations. Now note here that we exploit the independence of the counting process and the compound variables. Okay, so for some classes of processes that you'll undoubtedly run into at some stage, we allow the dynamics of y2 to be dependent on the outcome of its trajectory. So it'll be either explicitly or implicitly dependent on X and YT itself, um, which we refer to as state-dependent processes, um, for which simple results like these won't hold. But in any case, for anything within the scope that we've covered here, this result should, should be useful. And indeed, we've just looked at the case where X is discrete, um, but the same result can sort of be applied in the case where x is continuous, uh, where you just work in terms of the moment generating function. And again, you write the, you write the moment generating function of yt in terms of nested expressions for nt and the moment generating function of x. Now, as we've seen before, generating functions allow us to extract useful components such as moments and probabilities which we can then use to answer statistical questions about processes which otherwise have intractable dynamics, as is the case here. In the present case, we can also find the moments, for example, of the compound processes distribution. Okay, so let's consider again the case where x is discrete. Well, we can write the expectation of yt, which is just the mean of that distribution, 
um, in terms of the generating function as take the first derivative of its generating function, okay, and set its argument s equals to 1. Simple as that. Now, because we've written that generating function in terms of nested generating functions for its constituent parts, well, we can just apply the chain rule to those nested components and voila, we plug in s equals 1 into the argument, we evaluate the mean of that process as the product of two um, expectations, one coming from the counting process and one coming from the compound variable x. Okay, And then we see that that expression evaluates to lambda times t times mu, where lambda is the rate parameter for the count process and mu is the mean of the compound variable. Okay, Now this is a nice and neat interpretation, right? Because well, we can just write that, or we can we can read that as a rate, so the lambda parameter, times exposure, so how long did you observe the process, times a typical magnitude for x, and that gives you the expectation of uh, yt, the compound process. So if you think of it in terms of flow, that is exactly how you would have guessed what, this, what, what the appropriate expression is. And indeed, we can repeat the argument um, again with taking derivatives of the generating function to find the variance of the compound process yt. And we can find that as uh, the mean of the compound variable squared times the variance of the count process nt plus the expectation of the count process times the variance of the compound variable x. Okay, and that again, if we write it out in terms of the parameters of a model, is just lambda times t times mu squared plus sigma squared where that mu squared plus sigma squared you might recognize as the expectation of the compound variable x squared. Okay, and where sigma squared is just the variance of the compound variable. Again, this is a nice, neat, simple interpretation of a rate times some exposure time for which you've watched the process times some measure of variation in x, right? The compound variable gives you the variance of the compound process. We note also that both the mean and variance are linear in time. Okay, so the standard deviation will be square root in time. Okay, so we can have some idea of what we expect to see the mean and the variance trajectory to look like once we have the parameters of the process. So these give us the evolution of the mean and the variance of the distribution of the state variable yt over time, which in turn allows us to construct predictions and interval estimates, albeit again under some restrictive symmetry assumptions possibly, um, and indeed I've included a little toy example of what these might look like on screen for the case where the compound variable is normally distributed. I've also included some simulated results for reference to the, for, the, for the theoretical quantities that we've just derived, and indeed you'll see that they are quite similar. I've also included an empirical estimate of the distribution of the state variable, okay, so one which was constructed by simulation, um, along with an approximate distribution which I've calculated by numerical inversion of the characteristic function, a quantity which you should know is directly related to the generating function. So what that means, if, I, if I've used the generating function to find an approximate distribution, in case you were skeptical of the shape of that distribution, because as I'm sure you can see, even for the simple case, it's not quite a standard shape, but at least it seems like our moment and variance expressions seem to work well. Now, indeed, before we head to a concrete example, I'd like to stress a fair warning here. The distribution of the compound process can exhibit some rather interesting dynamics, even for simple configurations. For example, where the compound variable itself is Poisson, so where we have a Poisson counting process and the compound variable, which is discrete, Poisson, we have we observe a multimodal distribution with a large concentration of probability at zero. So definitely a non-standard distribution. Now, as you can see from the simulation on screen, care needs to be taken in applying any symmetry assumptions and interpreting moment-based statistics like the ones we've just derived in such cases. They may very well produce nonsensical results, like negative lower interval estimates, where the process is clearly distributed on the naturals. Again, this is checking your assumptions. Furthermore, even where that is not a problem, 
skewed compound variable distributions tend to result in approximate intervals being biased in one direction or the other. So again, just a fair warning, be careful when you use moment-based statistics on non-standard distribution or interesting distributions like the ones that manifest when you're dealing with compound processes. Cool, so let's consider an example problem. We'll continue with our marathon example where we now look at runners finishing between the 3 hour and 3 hour 30 minutes mark. So the 180 and 210 minutes marks respectively of the Yimmel and Arda marathon. And our problem now concerns nutritional expenses incurred at the refreshment stations over the duration of the run. So for those of you who don't know, every 3 kilometers along the route of a marathon there are refreshment stations giving water, energy drinks and all sorts of weird nutritional supplements. How this manifests in our data table, well, as usual, we record the arrival times, the inter-arrival times, and the number of runners who finish within the time window. But we then also recall the costs incurred for each runner, as well as the accumulated cost for each of the runners finishing within the relevant time window. Okay, so if we look at our data table, we saw the first runner came in around two minutes. First inter-arrival time is then also two minutes from Google Air to Club, and he used... Well, uh, she used nutritional expenses of up to 10 rand 50. And the cumulative cost at that point is 10 rand 50. Second runner, same story, used 3 rand 50 worth of nutritional expenses. Cumulated costs now 40 rand. Third runner used 15 rands worth of nutritional expenses, etc. Okay. And then it all adds up to a total of, well, there were 95 runners within that window, and the total expense was 710 rand 50. Okay. So this is setting up neatly. To be modeled using a compound Poisson process. Why? Well, you have a counting model to model the number of runners we observe in the window, and we have some additional variable which exhibits some random variation that can plausibly be modeled using a simple distribution. So we have a compound variable with a simple distribution. Now, based on this data, as part of a hypothetical race endorsement contract, so I'm just thumb sucking this, this isn't something real. Woolworths offers to sponsor the expenses for nutritional supplements uh, used by runners who have finished between the 180 and 210 minutes mark in the next running of the Yimmel and Arda event. Now, can we determine the cost of the endorsement? Cool. Okay. Um, so let's assume that the true arrival rate for runners in the given time window is always going to be three runners per minute. So regardless of what year we're looking at, for this particular time window, it's always going to be three runners per minute. Furthermore, the distribution of the nutritional expenses incurred for any given runners follows the following distribution. Okay, uh, any given runner will use three rand fifty worth of nutritional supplements with a probability of 0.1, five rand fifty with a probability of 0.2, ten rand fifty with a probability of 0.5, fifteen rand with a probability of 0.2, etc. And now the question is. How much should Woolworths budget for the endorsement of the 2022 Hill and Alder Marathon? Okay. Now, there are actually two parts to this question, right? So, we can already see that we can plausibly model this uh, using a compound person process. I've given you a rate parameter, so we can use our count process. I've also given you a distribution for a uh, compound variable. Okay. So can we use the results we derived today? Um, well, yeah, we just need to construct a forecast of what we expect the accumulated total to be. Okay, and indeed, as sort of part one of our answer, we do that, right? So we look at the expectation of Y210 minus Y180, okay? So the increment of the compound process over the window running from 180 to 210 minutes, okay? And from our results that we had earlier, well, that's just going to be lambda times the width of the time window, so 210 minus 180 is mu, where mu is the mean of the compound variable distribution. Okay, and we can evaluate that as 3 times 30 times 9.7, where the 9.7 is just the mean of the compound variable distribution. And then we calculate that as 873 rand. Okay, now note here that that is the expected trajectory, right, or I guess endpoint of the trajectory of the compound process over that window in time. And our question asked here, asked here was, how much should Woolworths budget for the endorsement? Okay, we have an expected trajectory, but remember that trajectory exhibits variation. Okay, and this is where part B comes in. Obviously, a conservative estimate 
would be more useful here since one would be more concerned with larger than expected outcomes where budgets are concerned. Okay, so what we actually do to answer this question is we construct a conservative estimate okay, of the endpoint of that trajectory as the upper end of a 90% fold interval, which again we use the, the, the answer from part 8 for. Okay, and we do that again as well evaluate the expecta ex expectation of the process trajectory over that time window, so y210 minus y180 plus 1.64, where that 1.64 is a quantile from a normal distribution, so again, vold interval associated with normal distribution and subsymmetry assumption, times the square root of the variance of the process over that time window, so variance of y210 minus y180. So we have our answer from before, we have 873 plus 1.64 times the square root of, well, what was the variance? Well, it's 3 times 30, so again, rate times the time exposure times some measure of variation in the compound variable. In that case, that evaluates the expectation of the compound variable squared, which you can now calculate as 107.4. Plug in all the values calculated, and then we said, okay, uh, it's approximately 1,034 rand and 24 sense. Okay, and that is actually the answer report as what should be budgeted for the endorsement. Why? Because it's a more conservative estimate of uh, the possible outcomes of that trajectory. Cool, so I hope you found that interesting. Again, there's so much more to be said about compound Poisson processes and derivatives of Poisson processes, and it gets really interesting once you allow the arrival rate to be state dependent. Uh, but that's a topic for a completely different series. Um, so I'll leave up some homework problems and then I'll see you in the next one.